Liz Truss is back. And now, according to her at least, she's popular. Just not enough to get invited to dinner parties, apparently. This is the New Statesman podcast. Conservatives have not taken on the left-wing extremists. The age of Davos man is over. I'm pretty sure the call 100 million years ago was trees and plants. So I would argue that that's sustainable. They're looking to being popular at London dinner parties. I never get invited to any London dinner parties, so it's not an issue. I'm Anusha Kellyan, and with me in the studio are the New Statesman's Associate Political Editor, Rachel Cunliffe, and the New Statesman's Political Correspondent, Freddie Haywood. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hello. Hi. So this week, Liz Truss, along with a host of other right-wing Tories, including Lee Anderson and Jacob Rees-Mogg and others, launched yet another new political movement or faction, somewhat amusingly called popular conservatism. I mean, what what is it? Is it one of these five families, Rachel, that no. you've been looking into? No, no, it's no. not one of the five families. Okay. Uh, and actually, uh, Mark Littlewood, who was the director general of the think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, is now the director of popular conservatism. He kicked off the whole event and he said, it's not another one of the five families. Right. This is broader. This is a movement. This is a concept this is a philosophy it's a mood it's an ambition it's a mood it's a vibe it's definitely a vibe uh and it is kind of drawing on populism but this kind of sense that the sort of core sense of it i think is the institutions the system the structures in which politics happen are broken so it's almost not about the politics itself it's about the system. That's kind of the broad overview of what it's trying to do. Uh, but he started off by saying, uh, or, or, or no, Jacob Rees Mogg started off by saying, uh, You're all popular conservatives here. I can see how popular you are. And there was a slightly nervous laugh at that point. Um, but it isn't. It isn't even clear, I mean, maybe, maybe Freddie will correct me on this. It wasn't even clear that it was specifically about the Tory party. Was it? It was more about ideas? Yeah, so I'd say there's a few issues that they were trying to address. You had uh, immigration, that was on sort of their leaflets, but it wasn't mentioned too much. So they want, for instance, to leave the ECHR to be able to bring down uh, immigration and also deport people who have come here illegally. That's one of their key aims. But it speaks to a broader uh, point, and that, that is that they're critical of international institutions. So we heard Jacob Rees-Mogg and others and Lee Anderson rail against uh, institutions like the World Health Organization, uh, the COP climate conferences. So essentially, it's it's a scepticism about any sort of uh, organisation that impedes national sovereignty. So I think one of the key driving themes of it was national so- sovereignty. Yeah. yeah, Davos Man, which was a, a, a coinage from Jacob Rees-Mogg, was in the firing line, um, as well as all of the things which we might come to expect from this group of conservatives, like green levies, the smoking ban, woke wokeism, um, and I, I just wonder. Because I suppose this idea is about a renewal of con- con- conservatism to try and make it appeal sort of on a wider basis. But it didn't f- sound like renewal to me. I think whining about quangos and political correctness and wanting tax cuts is very, very standard yes. Tory stuff. Quangocracy. They were taking aim at the quangocracy. I mean, I can't remember a time that I've covered politics when there hasn't been like a rump of the right who are obsessed with a yeah. bonfire of the quangos. In fact, David Cameron did that. I mean, yeah, I think they were making a broader argument about what's happened in politics over the past 20 years. This is one of the themes that keeps coming up. The past 20 years, which obviously includes the past 14, um, have led to many poor decisions, including the sort of like legalisation of uh, the democratic system. And I think that goes back to the sovereignty point. Jacob Rees-Mogg made a made quite a long speech and which contained some nuggets of truth. He was essentially saying that what you've seen in recent years is the decision making, the political decision making that in the past perhaps was made in Parliament being made elsewhere. And that was one of the key arguments against the EU, for instance. And now they're saying, now we've left the EU, there are still other things that we need to leave to allow the allow the people's representatives, MPs, to make decisions on everything. Hence the ECHR, the, the scepticism of that. But it also extends to things such as like the Human Rights Act, uh, the Equalities Act. They don't like the fact that the Supreme Court was taken out of Parliament um, in 2007 and, and made a sort of an independent, um, separate in, uh, organisation, obviously before it was in the House of Lords, so it was a part of the part of Parliament itself. So they are basically, I think, trying to retrieve some of what they see as the sovereignty and, re- and return it to Parliament. That's sort of like the overriding message. Yeah, and it, and it comes down to this view that I, I always find really interesting um, on the right, that the left 
has won. You know, ultimately, the left has captured these institutions and those things that you mentioned, like the Human Rights Act, the Equality Act, climate legislation, all of these were New Labour era policies that were brought in, as well as the change in the in where the judiciary sits. And so there's this idea that sort of Tony Blair has shaped our country in, in his sort of internationalist leftist yeah. image. And so despite the Tories having been in power for the last 14 years, they feel that they haven't really, you know, they've been undermined by, it's almost like a sort of deep state argument, but, you yeah. know, there is obviously a kernel of, of truth to that. You know, the structure, the international structures that were under were, you know, were underpinned by it, by changes made under New Labour and they were in for a long time. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's just a kernel. I mean, it, it's definitely true that the Human Rights Act shapes everything that Parliament does. The paradox is that Parliament's the one that could repeal that act and it could also leave the, uh, the, the, the Convention on Human Rights. So that's the choice. So it's not as if ultimately Parliament is any less sovereign. It's just in practice that day-to-day -day, those decisions that a Parliament might take, um, they can't do because of these, these institutions. I mean... The, the overriding sort of like test of parliamentary sovereignty is always can parliament bind its successors. And in one way, Tony Blair and new Labour reforms, they've managed to do so. Yeah. In part just because the Tories have been so impotent in the past 14 years. So yeah. I think that is interesting about the Tories not not repealing any of this because I've had this conversation increasingly with conservative MPs or aides and strategists where you know I'll, I'll say you know there's this problem whatever the problem is you know NHS immigration whatever you've had 14 years to fix it why haven't you oh well we couldn't because Tony Blair it set up XYZ and you know changed the systems and basically it's all Blair's fault and it's really interesting because if you then say which you do but you could have repealed that a lot of them will say yeah and we should have done and that should have been like the first thing we did in 2010 we should have come in and repealed that because the narrative is all of the failures for the conservatives to enact what they see as conservative policies they do blame the various conservative governments and prime ministers but they say it all goes back to new labor and they should have been bold enough to repeal this stuff and then they would have been able to fix all of these issues. So they're kind of, there is a self-awareness if you talk to people, kind of if you get sort of below the surface of it's all Tony Blair's fault, there is an awareness that governments, particularly David Cameron's government, could have done this and chose not to. And then you get into a sort of interesting personalities question, which is, okay, why didn't any of these conservative governments start worrying about this until now? Was it because... Well, it was they in the manifestos, wasn't it? Was it because they didn't realise how much of a problem it was going to be or, or how because it's quite technical are we going to repeal xyz law um or was it because the people who've been at the top of the conservative party actually quite like this stuff they quite like being part of international organizations and signing up right. to things and being popular on the world stage or at dinner parties which i think is what liz truss was trying to say when she was saying that sort of fellow conservatives uh, for conservative politicians want to be popular in the room where the popular people are and so they don't want to rail against the Human Rights Act or uh, international protections for refugees or LGBT rights because like they're, they're worried it won't make them look cool. And she basically said, well, I'm not cool at all. On that, how much is this, this about Liz Truss trying to find reasons why it didn't go well when she was Prime Minister? Because there is something, I do almost feel like there's something quite sort of emotional about this whole thing, you know, her coming back out, calling herself a popular conservative, which is, you know, she must see the irony of that. Yeah, it's the death of irony. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think she does see the irony. Um, but, you know, there's almost something very human about the fact that she wants to look back and think, well, it can't possibly have been that my ideas just, you know, collided with reality. It must be that there was this framework that was holding me back. Yeah, I think a lot of it is a personal redemption narrative. Uh, we just heard today that her book is coming out on the 16th of April, 10 years to save the West. So she has in the year and a bit since she was booted out of office, reinvented herself as quite an evangelical sort of free market, save democracy figure. She's quite big on the right in America. She announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that she was going to speak at CPAC, the, the big conservative Republican conference there. And obviously, like, there's quite a lot of money in America in that. And I'm not suggesting that's why she's doing it. I'm just saying that that movement is bigger in America More than it is here, yeah. a better resource. So I think it's, it's partly that. I think she has strangely 
positioned herself partly through circumstance rather than deliberately as a figure who can be the standard bearer for this wider cause, which is an international cause. You're seeing movements uh, elsewhere. Yeah, ironically. Uh, uh, ironically, yes. Uh, and actually, Jacob Rees-Mogg made this point when he was talking about the end of the age of Davos man. He wasn't just talking about the UK. This idea that national governments across the world right. are waking up to the fact that they have ceded too much power to supranational uh, global organisational governance bodies of whatever that may be and that that's a real problem and that people want democracy back into national parliaments. And I don't think any of this was a philosophy that Liz Truss thought that much about until October 2022. But having had the chance, she would say democratically appointed, not quite elected, but you mm. know, having had the chance to, to put her, idea, her ideas into practice and have it go so wrong so quickly rather than say oh the ideas were bad she can now say I was a victim of this system that everyone across the world is waking up to the fact that it's a really it's a really detrimental undemocratic system so I don't think that was the plan but the circumstances of her downfall have like given her that platform and made her that figurehead. Just on the on the ideas I mean all of the speakers and and the name itself are basically trying to say that they're conservatives mm -hmm. Um, I think it was Liz Truss or maybe it was Jacob Rees-Mogg who essentially said that the dividing line and the definition of conservatism is that they support the individual over the collective. That is, I mean, I, I don't know anyone who would recognise that as the definition of being a conservative. It was much more of a definition of being a libertarian. And it gets, uh, I think, to one of their core problems is that they're trying to convince people that this is what it means to be a conservative when... Lots of people in the country and also in the Conservative Party who would balk at some of their ideas. I mean, as if as if the Conservative thing to focus on is allowing SIGs for kids. You know what I mean? It's, it's, <laughs> this is not about, you know, ideas like the organic society, keeping people together, hierarchy, tradition. It's nothing about that. It's just about the promotion of the individual. And what's really interesting and quite ironic about that particular point, the power should go back to the individual from the collective, is the venue of this launch was the Emmanuel Centre in Westminster. And in May last year, that was the venue for the National Conservatism Conference. NatCon. NatCon, which was, other than NatCon, uh, NatCon or PopCon, uh, which was like Tweedledum and Tweedledee, which was this, uh, again, international US organised movement where Miriam Cates and Danny Kruger had spoken, obviously, Swella Bravman did a, a sort of quite sort of leadership pitch speech about immigration. But the national conservatism idea at least part of it, and the new conservatives, mm. is all about how rampant individualism has gone wrong. And this idea that people should have ultimate liberty to pursue whatever they want, that that damages communities, it damages families, it damages the sense of sort of civil society, it has broken up our responsibilities to each other. It's a very different brand of, I would say, more traditional conservatism. And that was being launched in the same building with... Some of the same people. I don't I'm, I don't think any of the speakers overlap. They did have a look at this. Did we smoke speak? Yeah. Oh, well, Remarkably. That's why it was so incoherent. I, I, yeah, but there's but incoherence going. between the communitarian sort of what you just, just described side of the sort of conservative opposition within the party and this free market side is how can that I don't understand how that and can, they're all grouped and as they're the all right. grouped yeah they're all well, grouped as the right and I don't understand how that can be sort of coherent remember you know the reason Suella Braverman and Liz Truss fell out was because Liz Truss wanted to loosen visa rules and make immigration e even easier and that that was what led to that sort of um she's changed her mind the, on the that. breach of the ministerial code she may have she may be saying that she's changed yeah. her mind on that but that, do, that doesn't fit into the fundamental outlook of those no, kind and of that, right wing and that's why it is a conflict within the party and that's why there are different groups so there's a debate going on but I think as its roots in Brexit you saw these different arguments for leaving the EU on one side you had those who are very critical of globalization about the fact that we had this like neoliberal rampant economic system that had degraded uh, societies and communities across the country and therefore we should leave to sort of maintain this sense of national unity mm. on the other you had this Singapore on Thames let's cut regulation let's cut taxes both of them supported Brexit for different reasons and at the same time we're seeing or now we're seeing both of them criticize things like the ECHR or the WHA or whatever it might be um, but for different reasons. So the, the, that, that's the debate within the party. I think given what Trust did in office and the sort of tarnish that's now been uh, 
brushed over her reputation, it's much more likely that the party is going to go in the National Conservative direction. So given, you know, there are these divisions within the right, but also these things that unite them in frustration, how much of this is a threat to Rishi Sunak's authority? Well, Mark Littlewood uh, began by saying this is not about who leads the Conservative Party. And there was like a a very nervous laugh, like from the audience. So I think uh, the fact that you're having alternative conservatism movements Mm. spurring up multiple times while Sunak is prime minister, it's not it's not great. But I actually think this is much less about what happens right now and what happens in the next election. It is all about laying the groundwork for what comes after. And uh, there are two things, two, two big battles that the Conservative Party has to have with itself after the election, although they're, they're starting early. But one is the battle for the leadership. And we've talked a lot about who the contenders are and how that might play out and why it is that it's actually in their interests probably to wait until the election has been lost before they start going for it because you want to be able to blame the defeat on Sunak, although some think that like you need to get rid of him quicker because you'll lose worse. But like that's the kind of that's one debate. The second debate I think is more interesting, and that is the battle for the narrative of one, why they lost the election, but two, why they achieved so little in 14 years. Like you talk to Conservative MPs and other than Brexit and some reforms on education, they really struggle to talk about, you know, positive things that they achieved in that time, partly because the ones that came later have completely want to distance themselves from the records of David Cameron. But partly because, like, they really struggled. You know, first there was a coalition and then there was Brexit and then there was COVID. And there is a big debate going on about how could you have been in power for 14 years and not achieved anything conservative and I think this conference and this movement and Liz Truss all feeds into one side of that battle which is why didn't we achieve real conservatism why did we fail it's because the system was against us and that's what this is about that's the story they want to tell and they want to start telling it now before the election so that when they lose the election you know they've laid the groundwork for it and it's a really powerful message right okay and so it's not a direct you know in number 10 aren't aren't sort of freaking out about these speeches that these these figures are making no i was speaking to someone in number 10 yesterday and they sort of dismissed it a little bit i think they're focused on other things really they're focused on the election and as rachel says much of this is about a broader debate about the past 14 years and also the next 10 so Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, going back to Rishi Sunak, he's obviously constantly trying to appease his party, implicate the country, and, but he's tried on all these costumes and none of them really fit. You know, he's tried to be the anti-motorist, the, the anti-net zero guy. He's tried to be the tax-cutting uh, libertarian guy. He, none of them really work. He can't do it. He tried the populism side. I think his speech um, that he gave on Rwanda, I think two weeks ago, when he basically challenged the House of Lords yeah. to not dismiss the will of the people was as populist as he's got because he was basically saying that any opposition to Rwanda is not a true representation of the people, which I think is normally quite a good signifier of populism. That didn't really work because he's not got really a a populist bone in his body. He can't be this sort of figurehead or spokesperson for the people uh, because he's clearly not the most average or normal person. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I was speaking to someone in the shadow cabinet who was saying the the Rishi, the costume Rishi tries on that we're most threatened by is him leaning into the reputation he had as chancellor, which was yeah. like, you know, the man who understands the spreadsheets and he's quite decent and polite. And, mm. you know, he helped us out in a crisis when he wanted to, but he's also hard headed economically. That's the kind of Rishi Sunak that I think, you know, is is quite authentically him. Um, but he, he just doesn't seem to have the confidence to lean into. And actually... I know this is slightly off the subject of our podcast, but we should discuss that he's had quite a bad week in terms of gaffes as well. Awful. So he, he well, there was that £1,000 bet on Rwanda flights taking off with Piers Morgan, which, you know, he said he was bounced into, but he shook his hand during this interview, didn't think on his feet. Um, he suggested King Charles's cancer was caught early, which he then had to caveat afterwards, seemed like quite a mistake. And then, of course, making a joke um, about Keir Starmer not being able to define a woman. Uh, during PMQs when Brianna Jai's mother was was in Parliament and about to come into into the public gallery. Um, so, he, he, you know, he, again, he's proving himself sort of not quite to not quite know what kind of politician he is, but also just very bad at thinking on his feet. Yeah, I think there were two things that I said uh, pretty much at the start of the Rishi era, kind of January, that I thought what 
he had going for him was boring because um, you know people, voters like boring. Uh, we had a lot of excitement over the last over the last uh, couple of years. Um, well, I don't think it's the voters like boring. I think it's that they like people being themselves. The, 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 the yeah. themselves being uh, you know technocratic. He talked about having integrity in uh, in his sort of opening pitch. You know, a real marked difference from the Boris Johnson era yeah. about being somebody who you could just trust to just get on with it. And you know, we talk a lot about how he gives off vibes of being head prefect yeah. or like a really excited A-level student and he's really into his spreadsheets, really into his maths and that is who he is. He's not a populist uh, and he's not somebody who can kind of command a room and get everyone to, to love them in the way that say, Boris Johnson did and that's okay and I think voters really can, uh, they like authenticity mm -hmm. and they can tell when somebody is, is sort of trying something on and I Think, I mean, it's it's really hard to say, you know, counterfactuals or whatever, and the economic situation hasn't really helped. But I think if he just stuck with the, I am a grown up who's in charge, I'm sorting out the economy, it's really difficult, but, you know, you can trust me, just get on with the job, me and my spreadsheets. I'm nothing like Boris Johnson. I'm nothing like Boris Johnson, and I'm not going to have any of these you know, wild internal personnel infighting battles. If he just stuck with that from the first half of 2023 to the second half of 2023, I think he would be in a better position than he is now because he has veered off so many times and trying to do this populist thing, which he's not very good at, it undermines all his credibility for the thing that he actually did have going for him. Thanks so much for watching. What do you think? Are the popular Conservatives a jolt of adrenaline for the Tories? or the sign of a party in the final throes of death? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button to help more people find it, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure you never miss an episode.